thank you. And it goes without saying that I want to thank um, profusely a woman's place. And, and the amazing work that they continue to do. And I also want to thank Holly Smith, who you've just heard from, Alice Sullivan, and Judith Suisa, three academics from this university. And these women are here at UCL and have had huge amounts of grief for organising this. And we shouldn't forget that this happens everywhere we go, however smoothly and wonderfully this event has certainly gone. Of course, I'd also like to thank the children's entertainers that met us when we first came in. <clears throat> Which is inclusive, obviously, running a creche for themselves. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, for those that don't know, that demonstration would usually just be for me, right? <laughs> But in the spirit of sharing and inclusivity, <laughs> I don't mind that it was for so many more of us. So I particularly want to address the young women in the room. Now obviously being 57, young can mean anything below 50. <laughs> but I mean the women who are at least a generation younger than me, maybe more, for whom I think things are hellish right now, but also full of possibilities. And there are some lessons we can take from the past, although we must never look back to the past. We have to move on in every political struggle. It's important that we never hark back nostalgically to the past because we're here now. And so I would say that what we need to do is to tell young women in this room you're not alone, and that we understand that your lives are full of things that we in our 20s, or younger even, couldn't ever have comprehended, could never have imagined the vile misogyny, the toxic misogyny, and I won't talk of toxic masculinity, I'll just talk of masculinity, <laughs> that is terrible, a terrible bind, but also what's grown out of that hideousness is this movement. Beyond a revival, I think we really are at a new stage in feminism. We've always had a women's movement, always, but this is really a pivotal moment. But we have to be careful because we've seen that in the past couple of decades that young women who would describe themselves as feminists got dragged into the neoliberal politics of the individual, where they dismissed any necessity for collectivism, where they would not have it that focusing on ridiculous, meaningless identities would get them absolutely nowhere, and that there would be no support, no backup, and no safety net. Identity politics without the politics is what we've got now. And many of us have lived through the original identity politics of the 1980s. So where are we now? We're coming back to recognising that women are a sex class, which means that men are also a sex class. Now, when we say this, we don't mean that Kate Middleton is oppressed by a man of colour who is homeless and jobless. We mean like for like. We mean that men, yes, all men, <laughs> oppress women structurally in every single bit of society in every country of the world. Some, of course, worse than others. But how do we recognise that for many young women, they have no sense of collectivity, they have no sense of a social movement. 
Some have no sense even, and not because they're stupid, but because of what they've been fed, I'm afraid, for middle-class young women, by many academics who should be ashamed of themselves. They have a sense... They have a sense that this is just all about individual rights. They think somehow rape in marriage was made a crime, violence against women and girls, acts committed by men, getting into the mainstream, laws being made and enforced and implemented. Huge, huge important changes that affect all women. Somehow this just happened organically. Young women who have said to me, well, what do you mean you were in the lesbian liberation movement? Well, why do you need that? We're just lesbians. Why do you think you're just lesbians, I say? <laughs> so I know for the young women in this room, and well done because you're here, and that must have been hard. So I get emails, I get emails and messages from young women all the time, some of you are here, saying, what am I going to do? Because in my social media group or my feminist society group, it's all led by woke men. Or they're the ones that are setting the agenda. It's a feminism for men. It's not for women. They're told that trans women are female and that natal women are oppressing them. They're told that the sex trade, prostitution, is empowering for women, that it's a job, that surrogacy is a way to make money, and it's nice and kind to do that. Now, speaking of kindness, and it's a word that has been misused, by some of the, the woke dudes. We just have to be kind to rapists in prison that say they're women and be kind by describing her erect penis. <laughs> and forgive me for those that have heard this story before, but an Australian feminist said to me that the only time that the term her erect penis should be uttered is when a woman has castrated her rapist and she's holding it up. <laughs> So, we're told to be kind. Well, do you know where my kindness will go, and yours, and how we'll benefit this movement, and how we'll grow the movement? It's that we recognise that we need to support each other and not feel patronised or undermined. When I was 17, I was lucky enough to meet feminists in Leeds, the best sort of feminists. <laughs> they were all about 15 years older than me, I'd been out as a lesbian for a couple of years. I was from the northeast of England, working class. It was hard. They'd all been through university pretty much. They weren't all middle class, but they'd all been through the left. I hadn't. And they supported me. They nurtured me. They mentored me. Now, we'd be cancelled for doing that. Fuck off, you patronising boomer. I would no sooner say to my feminist sisters that were helping me on the path to becoming a proper political activist, stop patronising me, than I, would, than I would to you, than I would expect you to say to me. So we need to get back to the truth about how we form political movements and how we actually build a wall of protection around those that have more to lose than we do, that are more scared than we are, who it would really destroy if they lost their job. And we need to be very honest about our privilege, even if that privilege is only with age and experience. Because it's much harder when you're starting off in life and your entire career and reputation could be ruined. At least I waited a few years in feminism <laughs> before I decided that uh, I may as well go the whole hog. <laughs> 
How else do we talk to each other about what is troubling us if we're not in a movement? When I was 18 and I was sacked from my cleaning job because the boss and his son tried to rape me, I was able to go to my feminist sisters and get angry. Where would those young women go now? Well, some of the ones that I've interviewed have told me that when men in their university library get their dicks out and start wanking, that they're told this is just about freedom, liberation. One even told me that she was told by a former stu another student, oh, he's not doing that for you. <laughs> for you! <laughs> How do we recognise that we need friendship groups? That we need the kind of groups that I had? All right, you're not going to sit and look at your cervixes these days. <laughs> like we were encouraged to. This was before the internet. <laughs> I know what mine looks like now. <laughs> I think it was a cervix anyway. <laughs> and that means getting offline sometimes and physically meeting each other, being together. Then, going out and maybe doing a little bit of direct action. It might well be that it's waving a placard and shouting, a little bit of civil disturbance. Whatever, like I say, some have more to lose than others. We work it out. We used to work out which one could afford to get arrested that weekend, <laughs> who didn't have childcare, or who hadn't just been pulled in by the police a few weeks ago and they'd recognise us. So, it's our job, as older or more experienced feminists, to say to young women, what can we do? How do we support you? See the young women out there shouting on the way in today? If I could have carried them all in and plonked them here and got them to listen, I know that they would have seen what we were saying. I know that they don't like this bullshit that they're being fed about being choked during sex, about being pissed on and spat at and degraded in their relationships and in their sexual relationships. They might have heard something in the lesbian panel that I went to, the workshop, where it was explained that to say that you are a political lesbian doesn't mean that you really are hot for men, but that you thought you'd better be a lesbian because it looks better, right? <laughs> there are things that we need to share. Information, history and context. Where we can say why we say there's a politics to our lesbianism. Because rejecting men sexually, oh, they see it as political, all right? So, so do we. And they need to hear. They need to hear when we say that there's a pride in being a lesbian, in saying that we're lesbians, that took me until I met feminists, thankfully when I was young, that stopped me thinking this was the most disgusting word on the planet. And now they're giving it up. So that's what we need to do. If they scream bigot and Nazi, and turf, and all the rest that they scream. Let's remember the women who were at this conference today. Who were those screamers? Who were those anti-feminist haters of real feminists who are now saying, thank God I just sat down and looked at what I was saying and what feminists do and really what you're about. Now, for working-class women, because let's face it, universities are now class-segregated. It's middle class. I know not everywhere, but this is the way it's going. So what do we do with working-class women who don't even have the feminist society with the bearded woke dude? <laughs> and then maybe they'll meet a friend, as women tell me they often do, who they know they agree with each other about prostitution or whatever. They sneak off to one of our talks and they hear stuff. 
Where do working class women go to talk about the abuse they're getting in their relationships, in their communities, the self-hatred they've been taught? What happens there? Because let's be honest, all of this unicorn blue fringe stuff, it's class, it's privilege. It's privilege. I have talked to feminists in countries around the world, from Kampala to Kar Karachi, everywhere, who say, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, what do they mean, they're non-binary non what? what? What does that... <laughs> because this is so irrelevant to material reality. <clears throat> So we need to keep moving ahead positively. Let's climb the hill and not die on it. That's one good thing we can do. We don't have to die on any hill, but we definitely have to be on the hill. <laughs> and without harking back to the good old days where actually not everything was perfect, Let's take some of the theories that we developed and the strategies for support and the collectivism and recognise that, yes, women all over the world are different. There's barely anything that unites us, in fact. We don't all have children. Some of us are white, some of us are of colour, some of us are disabled, some of us are heterosexual, whatever. But the one thing on the planet that does unite us, and we know this, is the fear and reality of male violence. And that's why we do what we do. So let's go onwards and upwards.